Hi, this is the Philosophical Angle, defining concepts in current media. I am your host, Chris Angle. I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Philosophical Equations of Economics. These books are available online, free for viewing, at www.philosophypublishing.com. Along with me are our panelists, Mark Brennan, professor at the Stern School of Business, New York University. He is also the American editor of the Quarterly Review of London, established 1809. Rick Samuelson is also with us. Rick graduated from Yale, has an MBA from Wharton, and an MA from Tufts. Rick is an independent investor. Welcome, guys. Howdy. Thank you. The purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the nature of the concepts being used in current media and compare the essence of the concept with the usage and circumstances in which the term is being used. The format to the philosophical angle is, is that your host will bring forth an opening statement on the nature of the concept, and our panel will react with criticisms, questions, and their comments. This week's topic is requested by a listener, Andy, in Minnesota. And it is the direction of the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency. A reserve currency is the monetary instrument which asset holders go for in, in, when, they re, when they seek stability and safety. Historically, the U.S. dollar has been that currency with the euro as a secondary currency most recently. As such, international goods and services are typically denominated in dollars, and international trade is for the most part executed in U.S. dollars. As an example, the oil trade is quoted and executed in the U.S. dollar. The dollar and the euro together account for nearly 90% of foreign exchange reserves. The two currencies together account for nearly two-thirds of all trading in foreign exchange markets worldwide. However, recently, analysts and investors are voicing doubts about the stability of the dollar and the euro. These doubts mostly have been generated by the debt ceiling crisis in the United States and Europe. Recently, Chinese officials have admonished the U.S. government about the need to be responsible with the dollar. Also, the United States, for the first time in its history, has received a downgrade on its credit worthiness from private rating agencies. Doubts about the euro are even stronger amidst its debt crisis. Thus, there has been a flight from the euro and the value of the euro has plummeted, leaving the U.S. dollar as the world's lone reserve currency. Although the dollar has strengthened since the flight from the euro, it has not returned to, the, to its place as king dollar, as its value relative to gold indicates. We, at the philosophical angle, will examine why that is. The dollar and the, US, and the United States have suffered economic collapse before as we have all read from our history. In the 1930s, there was a worldwide depression, which started right here in the U.S. Economic activity just prior to the 1930s depression peaked in the summer of 1929, and then there was a violent stock market crash. By 1930, most of the world was in a recession. Just prior to this, in 1928, Benjamin Strong, head of the New York Federal Reserve Bank died. Strong had provided the intellectual direction of the Federal Reserve. Without him, there was a vacuum in the decision-making process in the New York Fed, which was the de facto head of the Federal Reserve. Following his death, there, was, there commenced a transfer of Fed power from New York to Washington. The Fed, after Strong's demise and the shock market and the stock market crash began to tighten credit and raise interest rates. This resulted in worldwide credit markets to tighten and growth slowed. Soon after the international monetary system entered, a crisis and banks in Europe began to fail. Asset holders began to 
convert their cash to gold, inducing countries to take their currencies off the gold standard. Germany froze its international loans. Then uncertainty went to Britain. After a, a couple of interest rate hikes failed to stop uh, the, the fleeing of capital, the Bank of England exhausted its gold reserves and abandoned the gold standard, which marked the beginning of an international monetary crisis. In the ensuing weeks after the British dropped the gold standard, central banks went to redeem their dollars for gold at the Federal Reserve. And the resulting gold losses forced the Fed to raise interest rates while the U.S. economy was already in deep recession, thereby curtailing credit even more. The United States and, Europe and European nations while losing their gold foreign exchange reserves, all imposed capital controls that further hindered foreign investment and international trade. Instead of actively expanding money supply by more than the usual amount to offset the contraction, the system caused the quantity of money to decline steadily to early 1933. As credit decreased, bank failures in the middle, in the Midwest, and the South began to appear, which was followed by the closing of the Bank of the United States, which was a private bank in 1930. The other banks started to close as the investors began to fear for their assets. Unfortunately, the Fed's actions were hesitant and small as it stood idly by and let the crisis take its course. The solution would have been to supply liquidity to the banks or at the very least, declare a banking holiday until events settled down as pre previously happened in the U.S. monetary history. Then, to make matters worse, Congress passed the disastrous Smoot-Hawley Act. This bill raised tariffs on goods coming into the United States and had a tremendous effect in decreasing international trade, thus exacerbating the worldwide depression. In fact, in 1929, international trade was at $5.3 billion. smoot passed in 1930, and by 1933, international trade was at $1.8 billion, a contraction of about two-thirds. With the actions of the Federal Reserve tightening money and credit restrictions and non-actions of not providing liquidity, Along with the deterioration of free trade, the world went into a, a long depression. Could this happen again? The philosophical angle believes that this could not happen under present conditions. Even though the U.S. dollar is being downgraded because the world currency is now freely floating, the world's trade will seek one or more stable currencies to quote their goods and services and make their transactions. There is a stability in the presence of a free market system, whereby transactions are allowed to freely bid and freely ask the cost of their goods and services. Further, as gold and other precious metals are freely floating in the world markets against the various currencies, its effect is to alert the investor as to the stability of the various currencies and to allay mischief that governments may be doing in the value, to the value of their currencies by their penchant to print money, which causes inflation. Further, another reason why today is different is that there is no deterioration of free trade. Actually, there seems to be a trend in the opposite direction toward greater free trade, and as such, we conclude that the long-term outlook for the world economic system is positive, and the role for the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency is, is ever more important. In conclusion, with free trade increasing and the currencies floating freely along with precious metals, there is little likelihood of a depression setting in. However, there is a possibility of a recession due to over-government spending and the government printing of too much money to pay its bills as the direction of gold presently is indicating, which would cause harm to the savers of society. A stable value of the dollar is key to the economic health of the U.S. and the world. 
I'd like to turn to my panel guys and see what your remarks are for the for the direction of the dollar as a U.S. as the as the reserve currency of the world. Um, as usual, Mark, I'm going to start with you first. Uh, your uh, initial reactions. Sure. My initial reaction is, it, your, your talk brought back memories. One of my exam fields in my when I was doing my PhD was economic history, and I spent a good amount of time on the Great Depression which I thought was very interesting before I started studying it. And then when I really got into it, got into it in depth, uh, I learned how boring it was. And your talk now just confirmed exactly how boring it was. I hope our viewers are awake. Because that just <laughs> that put me to sleep. And uh, I, don't, I thought we were going to talk about reserve currencies, but you just went into this 15-minute uh, diatribe about, uh, I, I don't know, a diatribe that put people to sleep. That's got to be a first. Uh, so what is the question about reserve currencies that we're discussing? Whether uh, one uh, the, uh, the the direction of the dollar uh, versus gold and and two will continue to be uh, used as a as the world's reserve currency and three whether it is uh, whether there's a possibility of a worldwide depression being set in because of the dollar losing its value and because of its uh, uh, Possibly losing its status as, as the world's reserve currency itself. Okay, let me deal with the easiest one first. Go ahead. You asked. You asked. Will it be continue to be used as the um, reserve currency? And I'll make a big bold prediction and say yes. Because as we know in the stock market, the best predictor of tomorrow's stock price is today's stock price. So inertia holds in all markets. It most likely will be used tomorrow. The question, a better question, is probably. When might people stop using the dollar as a reserve currency? And if you look back at things that were in the past used as the reserve currency, uh, there's one out there that would really have a certain resonance today that should really do nothing more than make people laugh. At one point, the Greek drachma was the reserve currency. Now, that was way back when, and there are no more Greek drachmas. But if there were Greek drachmas today, I would bet a lot of money that they wouldn't be the reserve currency. The pound sterling was the reserve currency for a while. When the entire world fell on its face after World War II, uh, the United States was appointed, usually these things arise for the free market, but Bretton Woods appointed the United States as a reserve currency, and the United States was bound to redeem dollar bills for gold at a set rate of $35 an ounce. That's right. Now, if you used to get one thirty-fifth of an ounce of gold for your dollar, now you get one seventeen hundredth of an ounce of gold for your dollar. So That's right. That's where it's gotten us. You know, people talk about the benefits of it where, oh, we don't have to pay transaction costs to, to trade in commodities where other countries do, especially countries with less liquid currencies, have to pay a transaction fee to convert their money into dollars. Uh, but I'm very bearish, needless to say, on the American peso. I don't see good things coming. I think when you have $15 trillion in debt hanging over your head, your status as reserve currency, and when people like, when countries like China are kind of laughing at you and laughing at Tim Geithner, when he goes over and lectures college students and they literally laugh in his face uh, when he says everything's fine in the United States and your credit rating is downgraded by the agencies, uh, this will not persist. So my big bold prediction uh, that tomorrow that we still will be the reserve currency, at some point I'm going to have to change that. Uh, but it's the day is approaching. I'm just not sure exactly when. Rick, any uh, opening comments? Well, I, I find it interesting that the you know the US debt was downgraded for the first time ever and no one seems to be concerned about it it's not it's not a national issue not even the republicans are really talking about it. and so i guess i i take mark's point and you can see the value of the dollar being ground down gradually over time and at, you know in one sense part of it is structural because the u.s contribution to, to world gdp by definition is going to decline as other countries grow faster so that that's something we just have to accommodate the fact that the fed is no longer perceived certainly by external actors as being a, an unambiguously responsible steward of the U.S. dollar um, 
I think is obvious. It's less obvious to Americans or many Americans. Uh, but wor what worries me is the lack of political concern, which implies a lack of political will to actually do anything about this. That, and there's just sort of the assumption that this is not really a problem and not an issue to be talked about. I find that very odd and very surprising. Yeah, Mark, uh, you, you mentioned, I want to get back to you, and you mentioned that uh, uh, tomorrow, maybe not, that the world uh, reserve currency will be uh, the dollar. What would it go to were it not to be in the dollar? What could it go to? Well, so really what you're asking me there and what Rick touched on was the fact that other countries are growing faster and their financial, their those national balance sheets might be in better shape. You tell me which country is growing faster or which countries are growing faster with a more secure national balance sheet with better demographics, uh, with just better national prospects, and that's where it would go. Uh, I'm not making that prediction, but that's where it will gravitate to, and the market will decide that. You know, short of a cataclysmic event like World War II again, where a country is then appointed the reserve currency. But we've had a great run. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope you guys did. It's going to come to an end. I don't know if it'll be in our lifetimes. The predictions I make, since I'm a historian, we don't really make predictions, but when we do, they're kind of multi-century predictions. And if you look at David Hackett Fisher's work on inflation, he goes back a thousand years to look at inflation. He's not talking about last quarter like the government does. But, you know, my expectation is that this plays out in an unfavorable way for all the reasons Rick pointed out, foremost of which is this lack of will to do anything. And again, we've talked about this before. That goes back to the structure of a liberal democracy where everybody has just got their snout in the trough, elderly, wealthy people who are taking the social security checks, corporations who are getting subsidies, uh, rent seekers galore who are using the system to manipulate and take money from those who produce and give it to those who don't produce, or more than those who don't produce, those who are able to manipulate the system in such a way to get those people to just redistribute the wealth in their direction. So it'll happen. I don't know when, but it's sometime in the next 200 years. <laughs> okay, well, uh, um, so I, I take it from you know, both. You know, you know, you know, historians talk about contingency, and that's where, you know, everything kind of goes along the way it is, and then a chance event happens. And that's what will do it, this chance event. So who knows, maybe, you know, if we go uh, full bore into Iran, or if India and Pakistan start tossing nukes at each other, who knows where it goes after that? But when contingency happens, you know, April 1st, 1914, everybody thought Europe was coming, everything in Europe was coming up roses. Four years later, the world was a completely different place. That was purely a contingent event. Right. Uh, both of you guys seem to indicate that there is a correlation between government overspending and their deficits and the value of the currency, of their currency, particularly the U.S. Uh, would you uh, like to make comment on the, uh, uh, on the actual, uh, on this connection? Why is it that uh, greater deficits, or is it that greater deficits make uh, lesser value in a currency, or what is the connection between overspending and the value of a currency? Uh, either either one of you guys can respond if uh, if you would. Go ahead, Rick. I'm happy to, but if, please. Uh, well, it's it's a function of borrowing, right? Because if a if a government can't fund itself. Uh, in a structural way, and that's kind of the situation that the United States has fallen into. There can be cyclical instances when the government needs to borrow excessively and then pay it back um, as the business cycle recovers. But what we've gotten ourselves into in the United States, the UK is the same, and much of uh, the Eurozone is the same uh, to a greater or lesser degree, is we built in. Uh, entitlement programs that have taken on so much momentum of their own that if they aren't changed pretty radically actually we are going to see our debt to GDP ratio go from 100% to 110%, 120%, 140% kind of 
in, in lockstep with the requirements of these entitlement programs. Uh, and, you know, in the United States, a lot of it's associated with the medical care, um, Social Security, those sorts of programs. Those are the biggest drivers. And the problem is that if you owe the world money, okay, how can that the, the lenders like China, right? They they help fund us in a major way. The Japanese help fund us in a major way. Uh, how can they have any confidence over time as these debt servicing requirements grow that ultimately are going to be able to pay it back? That becomes the central question. It's one thing for it to be a cyclical deficit where they can see, ah, okay, the business cycle recovers, they'll be able to pay this back, just like any business does. When they see these structural deficits and the debt servicing requirements grow over time, then any rational lender is going to react the same way. And by the way, this in a period when interest rates are at abnormally low levels, and by the way, won't remain so. So the debt servicing requirements could spike quite quickly if interest rates just even normalize. Chris, I think there's a great opportunity in all that for the United States as a country. Uh, the rate we're going, we won't be able to pay this back. And I think that the opportunity is so big to start rationalizing not only government, but the American empire. China is going to come demanding repayment. And I think the first thing we should offer them would be Guam and the Mariana Islands. They would love to have them. We have no use for them. Uh, they're just another appendage of American imperialism. And if that isn't sufficient, I would toss out Alaska, but we might want to keep the drilling rights. But we can just keep kind of giving the tentacles of American empire back. We can give them Guantanamo, which is beyond useless. Uh, just keep giving them all of our imperial outposts until they're appeased. Because if we don't, and they come here and start attacking Americans on American soil, that'll be really ugly. Uh, now that the government has almost completely disarmed us. Okay, well, it seems to be that uh, you're, uh, you guys are relating the, uh, the value of the currency to the debt to default to the possibility, the growing possibility of default, and thus uh, a, a, a lessening of the value of the currency. Um, I'd like to uh, ask you, if don't, wouldn't you think also that really it's uh, add into that, that really that the penchant for governments to print money, and uh, uh, that really causes the, the devaluation to cover this possible default and the growing deficit. Uh, in the future, uh, their uh, pension to print money and distribute it into, uh, the, into commerce is the real uh, cause of the devaluation and the, and the ruination, possible ruination, of the, of the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency. Because if we look at through history and, uh, and, and currencies that have been a reserve currency, such as the drachma, it would have been that it's defla uh, inflation that causes it uh, 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 for the currency to, to go to ruination. Uh, what do you think? Isn't this another facet uh, necessary uh, to be included in the uh, uh, in the uh, in this scenario? Yeah, I mean, inflation. And when, we, when the when the hyperinflation starts, it's game over. But Rick and I have been saying that this entire discussion. So I don't really know how that question would even take us in a new direction. Uh, one one, is, one interesting historical parallel that you look at or analog would be the experience of England and France in the late uh, 18th century and how they financed uh, their continuing wars between each other. France just inflated and had huge problems and it helped, contributed to Napoleon's um, ultimate defeat. England would inflate for a little while with promises that they would go back to a non-inflationary policy. And over time, people put more trust in the pound. They knew that it was good for what they, they claimed it was going to be redeemed for. So France inflated. We saw what happened. England didn't. Uh, the United States right now has just been inflating nonstop for whatever reason. I think it's, you know, the tallest midget in the room. No currency, no other currency is better, so we can inflate all we want until uh, 
you know, finally someone says game over. Right. Uh, and I agree. I, I think since nine, in the last, uh, since 2006, the, uh, the, or actually since 2009, uh, after the first TARP, the uh, available money uh, from the Federal Reserve uh, going into the, uh, uh, into the banking system has doubled. Uh, you got you got you got to love the Republican Party and its TARP ideas. You got to love that the conservatives in this country are dishing out money to rent-seeking banks and auto auto manufacturers. If that's who we've got, you know, kind of being the conservative party, the, the stingy party that's going to keep us fiscally honest, it's hopeless. <laughs> uh, right. Well, in 2009, uh, with TARP, uh, 800 billion was added, and since then, it's it's more than doubled, uh, and. That's probably why the gold from that time has really gone from 700 hours to, uh, to more than doubled. Uh, yeah, but you know, if, so if, if, if Obama had out of the blue proposed TARP, Republicans might have stood up and said, no, this is, this is an idea we don't like because we're so tribal that anything Obama says we don't like. But when Bush does it, we go back to the same tribal mentality, and therefore TARP and bailouts and payments to union auto workers, that's all, all okay. So when Obama continues the process, I have a a lot of trouble suddenly watching Republicans stand up and go, oh, this is terrible. Look at how much he grew it, whereas Bush didn't grow it. Bush opened the door. And when you open the door, all the pigs fly in. OK. Uh, final remarks, Rick. Uh, we have about 30 seconds. Uh, well, I mean, I should have made the, the link clearer. But it, the fact that the Fed can, what, what surprises me is that the government uh, maintains we've been in recovery for almost three years, right, officially. And yet the Fed continues to insist that we need ultra low interest rates. Why is that? Why is that? Okay. Well, why aren't we returning to a normal interest rate regime? Rick, it's obvious because, because so the banks can fund their carry trade with low cost money. Thank you, guys. I have to end it there, and we can renew the discussion later on uh, in further installments. I want to thank the viewers for uh, listening, and um, thank you for looking at the philosophical angle. Good day.